All right, folks, um, it's 5.01, so I think we should get started. Um, welcome, everybody, to the May Tech Stack, or sorry, tech, Combined Tech Stack and ESIP um, Tech Dives Talks. And um, we're meeting at an unusual time today, 5 p.m. Uh, Eastern, because Kevin Ring here, who hopefully you can see over on the left, <laughs> um, is uh, joining us from Australia in, in Sydney, right, Sydney? That's right, yep. Yep, and um, so he's going to talk to us today about um, uh, Terry JS, and I want to just uh, just want to show folks here. I'm going to I'm going to pop my um, my webcam back off here now that you've uh, you've seen us, <laughs> and um, uh, okay. And uh, I just want to point out that if you want to see the um, any of the talks that we've done here on Tech Dive, they're all recorded. And you can go back and look at the, the previous, any of the previous talks. And I just want to point out before I forget that our next talk is going to be June 8th, and it's going to be um, installing Jupyter Hub in the cloud using K Kubernetes Helm. <laughs> and it's, by, uh, it's going to be given by UV Panda, who actually I don't know who he is, but um, he's been hanging out on the Gitter channel. <laughs> I, I will find out eventually who he is. Um, Anyway, uh, today we have Kevin, uh, who we've done a lot of uh, work with actually um, here at USGS over the past. He actually gave a talk about three, I think maybe two plus years ago to the USGS Tech Stack Working Group, but we're really excited to have him uh, back today talking about this uh, open source library that he's the, the lead developer for. So I am going to just switch it over to you, Kevin, and uh, okay. yeah, let me... We just have to find you among all these people who are attending. <laughs> and I'm going to make you the presenter. And you should be able to take the ball and take it away. Uh, great. Thanks, Rich. Um, and thank you all for having me. Um, this, I, I've kind of been burned in the past, I guess, by, uh, by trying to do presentations from the other side of the world like this, especially of something like Terry Jess, which is sort of interactive and um, uh, you know, has 3D graphics and that kind of thing. So what, what I've done, and I hope it's not too awkward here, is I've, I've put the sort of initial part of my presentation, which is really demo heavy, into a YouTube video. And I think it'll just work better for everybody if we, we go watch that rather than we try to stream it over, over Citrix here. Um, so the, the link to that is at the top of the, the chat window in here. I uh, hope everybody can see it. And um, I guess probably the thing that makes sense is if everyone uh, goes in and, and clicks that video and uh, and watches it, and we come back in, let's say, come back at 7:35, um, and I can do some follow-up demos, um, answer questions, um, and we can just discuss some more. Um, but I think that kind of sets the stage, and it'll work a little more reliably to try to stream it over over a go-to meeting here. So, any <laughs> questions about that? Can we send the link in chat, please. Uh, I, yeah, it's there. I'll send it again because it kind of scrolled off the top here. Uh, or maybe it didn't show up. Of, uh, that one, yeah, the link, uh, it only will be in chat for after people have joined. So if it was oh, that before people have joined, they will be able to see it. Oh, all right. Okay, and I'll, and I'll keep chatting it because just for anybody who shows up late or something. And then, and then later, I'll um, I'll piece this together. I'm not going to try to show it. I'm not going to try to show it here um, because the audio doesn't really work that well, you know, as, through the uh, presentation. So let's just go ahead and do that. Yeah, and then meet back meet back here, and I'll uh, join these all up for the recorded version of this. Sound good? Sounds good to me. All right, five, four, three, two, one. See ya.
All right. Um, is our folks is our folks back? We don't have to. <laughs> Hopefully, they're not going to go. Folks are not going to go off and read their email for three minutes. <laughs> um, Kevin, are you there? Yep, I'm here. Okay. Anybody need a couple more minutes? Uh, yeah, I don't know. I guess maybe we should give people one more minute. I'm, I'm, I I was um because I because I had watched this before, Kevin. I was uh I was like, playing around on my phone with the um with the 3D um and man, it was um it was incredibly responsive. That was uh yeah, yeah super cool. Yeah, when we first started Cesium, it was um it was a bit clunky, but these days it's it's pretty nice. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, well, let's see. Uh, are there folks, uh, I guess, is there anybody, let's see, I'm, I'm not sure how um, I'm going to be able to tell if everybody, I guess I could, I can chat. Yeah. Maybe I'll just chat everybody. Um, is anybody not done? <laughs> And um, okay, I think we better. I think we should just um, go ahead here. Um, does, does anybody have any questions? I've got some questions, but I'd like to let other people go first if they have some questions for Kevin. Uh, hopefully, I, I think a lot of you are muted. Um, if you want to un. You're going to have to unmute yourself. Okay. Um, well, you know, let me ask a few questions, and um, maybe some folks are, like, actually tuning back in at, uh, at 535. Um, Kevin, one question I had was, um, you know, the, the terrain, the 3D terrain stuff is pretty cool, and um, is it possible to use your own terrain for um, to put into to Terra JS yeah I yeah it is um, there we have a, uh, a terrain catalog item which means that you can make uh, a terrain data set any terrain data set that's compatible with cesium uh, an entry in your Terra JS catalog um, and of course the the difference between uh, terrain and any of the other sorts of data that you can add to, to your map is that you can really only have one set of terrain at a given time. So uh, when you turn one on, it turns you know an, an existing one off. But um, other than that, it works pretty smoothly. So so it would be possible to use that this to say perhaps explore like lidar data or um, you know like new drone based uh, terrain surveys. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we have a, uh, there's actually a startup here in Sydney that, that's called uh, Propeller Aerobatics that is using a uh, Terry js based application to present um, photogrammetry derived terrain and imagery uh, to their users. Um, and they, they use this mechanism that I was just talking about. Do they have any, um, is that proprietary or do they have any uh, catalogs that they could share on that, you know? Uh, that is proprietary. Um, they have a, a, a decent video that kind of shows it off that I could I could show maybe, but yeah, unfortunately, there's no no publicly accessible software we can show. Yeah, for the for the drone stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. I, mean, I want to pause here and uh, just see if anyone else has questions. Yeah, Kevin, this is Rob Dollison. Can you guys hear me okay? Yep. yep. Hi, Rob. All right. Yeah, I just had a question on some of the tool libraries. Do you have sort of other standard sort of analysis tools, things like measurement or buffering or profile, some of the other, you know, sort of standard, yeah, so, standard that kind of thing? Yeah, right. Um, so the first one you mentioned was um, was measuring. So we do have that one. I can get the go-to meeting window out of my way here. Um, so we do have a... a measure tool within Terry JS. So if you can still see my screen, this is what it looks like. But you draw out lines as you'd expect and it tells you the distance along them. Um, but Terry JS isn't really meant to be a general GIS tool. So we haven't put a lot of emphasis on 
and sort of the, the typical GIS stuff of, of buffering and all that, right? Um, yeah. So, you know, certainly you could integrate other tools that do that sort of thing. Um, and you could use TerryHS as the visualization of that. Um, and you can also hook into, you know, if you want to run geoprocessing services on the server, there's um, hooks to uh, present the, the interface to that in the in the TerryHS UI and then um, ship it off to a server to do the computation and then display the result back in TerryHS. Uh, but there's no built-in support for um, for those kind of GIS tools other than this yeah, measurement. That's, that's thanks, it's very helpful. Yeah, I, I could see you know most of the focus was on visualization and uh, interesting you know, excellent capabilities on the catalog. I know we uh, used the earlier versions and done some experimenting with that and hope to continue to to uh, work with the newer version. Yeah, cool. Anyone else? So um, I had a couple other questions, <laughs> and uh, you folks can keep uh, jump in after me. But um, I know that you mentioned CCAN uh, catalog search, and I know I don't think you mentioned CSW, but I know you have. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> yeah, you have the ability to um, make a catalog item that does dynamic uh, queries on CSW as well, right? Yeah, that's right. Um, and and actually, <laughs> certainly, Richard. You know, you're you're uh, you're kind of an expert in that, right? Um, you've done a lot of really good work with um, pushing the envelope for the CSW support in TerraJS. So, um, pretty much the way it works is you can create a catalog item or a catalog group within TerraJS. So, um, you know, all these things I'm showing in the UI right now are are catalog groups, and when you expand it, it does a live query to a CSW server using a, um, a customizable query payload, right? And, and then when it gets back the response, the, the data sets that the CSW knows about, we organize those into groups, like you see here, um, and any uh, geospatial items that Terry just knows how to show, show up as catalog items that can then be added to the map. Um, I don't know if I have a good demo of that handy. What I, what I just showed here is, um, the CCAN, which works essentially the same way. Uh, yeah, maybe. And I think I, I, I think it's I, I, that's, I think that's okay. I, I and I think I asked this question to you before too. But if you wanted to build a tool, say that would let, be a user interface to you know allow somebody to select a region, say select some institutions, some key you know keywords. Uh, you know, a time extent and all that kind of stuff that would go into one of these queries instead of formulating it in the catalog. How would you, would you go about that by um, creating a service, or would um, would you just build something right into Terraria JS? I mean, I'm just trying to explore like the um, what a developer, you know, how a developer would kind of yeah. add that functionality. Yeah, it's a good good question because I didn't I didn't cover that really well during the, the presentation there. Um, so one of the, the important design focuses of, of TerraJS you know, from a code architecture kind of standpoint is that it's, uh, it's meant to be really extensible. So all of the, the connectors to different types of geospatial data uh, and also catalog services um, are a, a sort of a common interface that you can plug other functionality into. You can plug other sources into. into. So, uh, we could write a, a new type of catalog group that knows how to query a new type of catalog source, for example. Um, and then what Rich was just getting at there is that um, it's also possible to do some pretty neat things like make a, a catalog group. Remember, a group is, is like the folders that you see here. But rather than just open it and you're done, we can present the user with um, uh, basically server-defined inputs to that group. So rather than just a straight up group where you open it and you see whatever's in it, when you open it, you're asked um, for parameters to the query, which once you supply, it, is, it does a query to the server, gets back responses and, and dynamically presents that in the UI. And that was sort of what you, that was sort of what you were, I'm oh, sorry. But that was sort of what you were showing with the templating in your catalog entry, right? Uh, I mean, a related concept, I guess. 
Yeah, similar idea, definitely. Yeah. So that's that's uh, that's a templating on the on the feature side. So when you click a feature on the map, how do we present it to the user? Yeah. Um, whereas this is um, this is more like templating on the um, on the catalog group. Right. side. So same idea, but a different application. It's, yeah. it's actually really similar to the web processing service thing that, that I showed in the video there. Um, you know, the difference being that when you query a WPS server, uh, um, you, what you get back is, uh, you know, maybe some map-based data or a chart or something like that. Uh, in this case, you would supply parameters in much the same way, but, but what you would get back is, uh, is catalog entry. Right. Okay. Um, anyone else? <laughs> I don't want to hog all, <laughs> hog all the questions. Um, yeah, this is Micah Wengren. I have a question, actually. Go ahead. Um, the, um, the like development environment for Terry JS, does it have a full API or catalog of controls? Um, can you programmatically, say, change the layout or user interface easily as a developer? Yeah, as a developer, you certainly can. So the, the Terry JS user interface is, is, um, is built on React. Um, and so the, uh, you know, at a code level, um, the whole thing is very componentized and it's possible to, um, to you know, take the existing components and move them around, put them in different sections of the screen or, or choose to exclude some of them or add new ones or that kind of thing. And I guess you gave some, and you gave some examples of different groups, I guess, who had kind of put a different, a little bit of a different uh, um, skin on Let's get on it. Um, yeah, sure. So uh, one example is, everybody still see my screen okay? Yeah. Um, so this is, this is the uh, State of Environment Report map. Um, and one of the neat things that, that this app incorporates is uh, a help system. So um, if I hit this help button, uh, I can choose one of these things, and it does sort of this interactive on-screen help. Right. My mom needs to stop calling. <laughs> uh, so uh, that's an example of, of custom widgets that are integrated into uh, an application and sort of uh, alongside Terry JS. Um, the, the other thing I can show you is this is the Terry uh, Terry JS website here, and if we go over to documentation. Uh, um, this has documentation for uh, how to connect to different sorts of data. So these are catalog items that are represented on the map as, as layers, essentially. So we can go look at how to set up a web map service, for example. Um, so there's, there's APIs. Um, and first of all, there's a, within the code, there's an object model that you can code to. Um, it's also possible and more typical, I would say, to configure Terry AJS using um, JSON configuration files. And it has really rich capabilities for defining what's on the map and controlling the map um, by doing things like uh, dragging and dropping JSON files onto the map or specifying their URL in the, the map's URL or uh, even controlling it using cross-window messages. So embedding Terry AJS in an iframe and then having an external web page that includes that iframe, um, add data to the map by posting messages. Does that answer your question at all? Yeah, that's basically what I was, what I was wondering, so thank you. Anybody else? Yeah, I mean, that, maybe it's worth repeating. I mean, you just mentioned it, Kevin, and I just didn't realize that you hadn't shown this, but one of the things that I thought was, that attracted me to Terry JS when I first saw it was this uh, concept that you could basically put on the URL, uh, add to the URL, add to the base, um, you know, Terry JS URL a URL that pointed to a JSON file that was just sitting out there, say, you know, it could even be a, as, a, as a gist or something, and that that would um, basically create a custom portal 
um, you know, with a bunch of layers and a bunch of behavior and like that bird migration demo, all yeah. without all without installing anything, you know, just uh, just creating something out on uh, as a gist, and then and then you can give somebody a URL and they think you've created a fancy portal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, let's see if I can show you what that looks like. So if I go to national map here. Um, and then go to this config JSON file that I happen to know exists. You can see this initialization URL section, and this is defining the, the set of um, JSON files that are loaded in order to define the catalog. So if I take that URL for national map there, and uh, I go over to this other Terry based map, based map here, um, and add that to the URL, um, let's reload that. Uh, so the first thing that happens is I don't have a catalog anymore, right? So by specifying clean in the URL, it says don't load the default stuff you're supposed to load. And then I can add an, uh, another parameter to the URL, which is the name of a JSON file to load. And when I do that, oh, now we have the national map catalog inside the state of environment map here. And this is just, if I open this URL, let's see what this actually looks like. Uh, I was hoping it would show me and not download but, but all right, we'll deal with that, I guess. Uh, try to format it. <laughs> this catalog's pretty big, it might take a second. Um, yeah, there we go. All 95,000 lines of the catalog here. Okay, um, so this, this is the JSON file that defines the national map catalog. And um, it's kind of what you'd expect. There's a, a group called national data sets. Um, initially, it's open, and it has these items. And the first item is uh, called broadband map, right? And it's a WMS server at this URL. And you know, we specify a bunch of parameters about it. Um, if we keep scrolling down, we can see different types of data set, uh, these are all WMS so far, for one that's not, uh, mostly WMS, okay. Um, so here's, here are, here are examples of some catalog items that are Esri map servers. So you can write a file like this, and there's documentation on the website that shows you how to do that, and host the file just about anywhere, just or um, any kind of static web server, and you can point any Terry map to that file, and you get a catalog. You get a you get your catalog presented in in the map, either in addition to what's already there, or if you specify clean, you can completely replace the catalog that's there. So it makes it really easy to sort of drop your data into a, a Terry map without even needing to deploy your own copy of it. I think I think particularly for like small like organizations, you know, um, like like here locally are you know the Save the Bay group who is interested in bringing together watershed information, some different environmental layers and stuff like that, they can use the thing, they can use this to, um, you know, just bring in some different uh, layers and maybe add a little bit of um, custom, you know, metadata of what they want to show up when people click on it right here in the JSON and sort of customize that experience just for, you know, their little community, again, with like, you know, spending nothing, installing nothing, you know, just learning. Um, the documentation for how you actually write this little JSON stuff. So, you know, um, I, I think it's a, I think it's a really interesting niche that this fills. <clears throat> anyone, um, anyone else have some questions? <laughs> I had one question. Yeah, go ahead. No. Uh, this is Rob. I had a question again, and I'm not a developer, but I'm curious on, um, you know, some of the work you've done with your Australian data.gov, some of the challenge there. Say, I know you're early on and looking at how you will collaborate and prove that exploration, but I was just curious, some of the challenges you've seen working with it so far, and I don't have enough knowledge to know if the core you know, metadata they put in there, like ISO metadata, or you work and just with, I know you're doing mostly with the, you know, the web coverage, I mean, the catalog service interface to it. 
Anyway, yeah, I'd just like if you could expand a little bit with some of the work you've done there. Yeah, um, yeah, since um, you mentioned, was somebody started to talk there, I think? No? Okay, um, so yeah, since you mentioned metadata, um, that's that's getting at kind of one of the, you know, I said that, that the work we're doing with data.gov.au is trying to apply some of the concepts from Terry.js. And, and I think one of the most important concepts from Terry.js that we want to bring to data.gov.au is, is the notion of, um, of being very tolerant of whatever sometimes junk is out there, right? So, um, you know, rather than trying to, to say, all right, if you want to get your data on data.gov.au, you need to conform to this metadata standard and it needs to be provided over this sort of service and, and you know, these are the rules and take it or leave it, right? Which pretty much doesn't work. Um, we are taking the approach of um, there's a bunch of, of data portals out there already. You know, this, the states often have their own data portals. Um, the local councils have their own data portals. Um, sometimes corporations have them, right? And uh, we want to try to connect and federate whatever already exists out there and to do the work necessary and to make it easy to do the work that's necessary in order to, um, to bring those together in a unified way that makes sense and to, you know, overall allow people to, to access all of the open data across Australia in a, in a unified way, even though it started out as something that's not at all unified. Does that make sense? Are you going to do that by brokering? <laughs> Sorry, are you going to do that by brokering? Are you going to create brokers that suck data from these other places and sort of re, re you know um, provide more standardized services by adapting them, or just what's the approach? Yeah, that's basically the idea. Um, you know, CKN has this notion of harvesting, and and that's that's not too far from what we want to do. Um, except that the harvesting tools need to be vastly more robust than they are today and more flexible. Um, and we also need to, um, to stay really focused on the, on the idea that once our data portal, data.gov.au, harvests some data sets from another source, we don't own those data sets. Those aren't our data sets now, right? Just because we learned about them doesn't make them make them ours, the authoritative source of those data sets is still wherever we got them. Um, and we need to make that really clear through the user interface and we need to be really clear about that whenever we update the data so that we don't um, put too much, you know, we, we always hear horror stories about two data portals that har harvest from each other, you know, the, the uh, state of Victoria here in Australia and the data that comes to the EU. You know, you hear story stories about how a data set gets added to one, and then it gets harvested by the other, and then it gets deleted on the first one, and uh, it, through another cycle of harvesting back and forth, it reappears, right? And that's a, a sort of a sort of an embarrassing thing to happen because in order for that to even be a possibility, um, someone along the way lost sight of the fact that um, that's not their data set, right? It's, uh, it, you know, it, it came from there, and if, if it doesn't exist there anymore, then it doesn't exist. So. Yeah. All right. Um, anybody with a last question? If not, um, I'd like to thank thank Kevin again. Kevin, that was really uh, tour de force there of all the capabilities um, that you've been working on there, and. Um, I know that we're going to continue to um, be exploring things that we can use it for and potentially add features to. Um, and um, yeah, so thanks again. Thank you once again so much for uh, for having me. And uh, yeah, I'm happy to. If you have any other follow-up questions or anything, please just shoot me an email or or uh, whatever. All right, and we'll see everybody in a month. Thank you very much. <laughs>